There we go. Had a little bit of a glitch, but we got things going. Welcome to the Monday live stream. This is where we go typically verse by verse through a book of the Bible. We're doing the Gospel of Mark right now. And the passage we're in, I think, has been abused, shall I say, as many passages of the Bible have been, especially when it comes to this phrase from Jesus where he says, you will always have the poor with you. Um, now, I, I want to tackle that. And I want to talk about different abuses. And I just want to say ahead of time, Please try to hear what I'm saying. Uh, this is not about politics, but it touches on politics because politics keeps touching on things that Christianity is about. <laughs> and if we're going to be Christians that are solid in our commitments to Christ, we need to start there with understanding our Christian view, not asking the question, what side does it fall on in the very divisive culture we're currently in, but first just saying what's faithfulness to Jesus. But ultimately, what we're doing today, this is the 58th part of the Mark series, verse by verse through the Gospel of Mark. We're in Mark 14, verses 1 through 11. This is where Jesus is anointed for his burial. I did a, an apologetic type Bible study, which means defending the truthfulness of something, uh, answering the question of whether there's a contradiction in this passage. I did that last week. This week, we're doing a verse by verse study to learn what we can learn about the passage for our own lives and to understand and interpret it properly. There's a very significant moment when Jesus is anointed. I think that this is a picture of Jesus's overall work. There's like a a lot of symbolism here that is often just missed. Um, it's a major turning point for Judas, for Judas himself. We're going to find out like why did Judas betray Jesus and and what can we learn from it? Because if we're humble about it, we realize like I could be like that because he didn't just suddenly turn bad, right? It, there was a progression, it seems, that happened in his life. So um, we'll also talk about a Mark and sandwich, which is one of my favorite things in the Gospel of Mark is those yummy sandwiches. We'll get there in a second. Um so yeah, a number of questions to talk about and the whole idea of the poor always being with us. Let's just read through the passage together. Here we are in the Gospel of Mark chapter 14. We're going to read through it. And as always, I like to read the passage because I just want to load it in your mind. I want to be talking about something you're familiar with, not just telling you what to think without any sort of connection to the, the text of scripture here. So Mark 14, 1, we're going to read through the first 11 verses. Just load the passage, get get familiar with it, get comfortable with it, and then we'll unpack it carefully. Now, the Passover of and unleavened bread were two days away, and the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to seize him, Jesus, by stealth and kill him. For they were saying, not during the festival, otherwise there might be a riot of the people. While he was in Bethany at the home of Simon the leper and reclining at the table, there came a woman with an alabaster vial of very costly perfume of pure nard. And she broke the vial and poured it over his head. But some were indignantly remarking to one another, why has this perfume been wasted? For this perfume might have been sold for over 300 denarii and the money given to the poor. And they were scolding her. But Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you bother her? She has done a good deed to me, for you always have the poor with you. There's that phrase. And whenever you wish, you can do good to them, but you do not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for the burial. Truly, I say to you, wherever this gospel, the gospel is preached in the world, in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be spoken of in memory of her. Then, Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went off to the chief priests in order to betray him to them. They were glad when they heard this and promised to give him money. And he began seeking how to betray him at an opportune time. Random thing I just don't think I noticed before is the phrase opportune time. Satan tried to tempt Jesus and then he left waiting for an opportune time. And then here, Satan is one of the agents involved in the betrayal and crucifixion of Christ. And he has, there's Judas looking for an opportune time. I never really noticed that. That's really interesting. Hmm. Okay. So Mark 14, the, uh, the Passover and unleavened bread are two days away. The text tells us, and this is the Passover where Jesus is going to be crucified. And here we are. I mean, Palm Sunday was yesterday and we're like, the, the crazy thing is we're like at, at the moment that this passage is talking about. This is this is the time of the week, the time of the year when these things were actually happening. And so that's pretty interesting. This is unintentional. I just happen to be in this passage as I go verse by verse. 
But what we, what we need to know here also is that Passover is a generic term. It refers not just to a day, but to a, a time. And un, Passover and unleavened bread originally two, looked at as two different things. They were in the common language of the people. They were talked about as a season of time. So you could kind of say Passover is like saying Christmas time, right? Christmas time can refer to the day of Christmas or it can refer to like a season leading up to Christmas as well. So it's a, a bit of a generic time period, although it does have specific days that are important within that time period. And it's about two days away. And that's when this meeting takes place where the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to seize him by stealth and kill him. I talked about this last week, so I'm not going to recover that ground. This is all new information for you guys. The, uh, the chief priests want to kill him. This has been a long time coming. Uh, Jesus has obviously been a thorn in the side of the chief priests and the scribes and all these guys for a long time. He's this outsider. He's not approved by them. He keeps ripping on them and he keeps getting more bold. Jesus, you know, was healing people, but then telling people like, don't tell anyone what I did. Um, he wasn't being open. He was speaking more in parabolic form, but towards the end of his ministry, he's more open. He's more bold about his declaration that he's the Messiah, he, the triumphal entry, right? Palm Sunday that just happened. And I call that the ironic entry because if I think we want to highlight all the ironies that are present there, that are deliberately there. Um, but at any rate, that happened. And that was like a public proclamation that he's the, he's the coming king of Israel, which to them, those are fighting words, right? They want to kill Jesus. We learn from John that Jesus has raised Lazarus and that has created, created a stir among the people in the Jerusalem area. There's just a lot going on. There's a lot going on. They really want to kill him. They want to get rid of him. So that's the plan right now. Um, but there's a problem. So they say in verse two, not during the festival, otherwise there might be a riot of the people. So what's the problem here? Um, it, it really helps us because we're so removed from the biblical culture, especially from, and I say biblical culture as if it was one culture. I mean, even just in the first century, there's the Jewish culture, there's the Greek culture, there's the, the Greek speaking Jews, and they have a different culture than the Jews. It's, there's just, there's a lot going on. Okay. So let me help you understand the powder keg that was Passover this time of year. Now, you, you might think, oh, it's like Christmas in the sense that it's a great religious celebration. Okay, true, it's a great religious celebration, but not like Christmas, okay? The Jews, the, the Jewish people are feeling oppressed and held down by the Romans who, against the will of the Jewish people, are controlling them and taking over them just like they were so many people at the time. They, at the time of Passover, they have massive numbers of extremely zealous Jewish people coming to Passover, coming to Jerusalem in particular, like the population of Jerusalem spikes way up as people from all around the country gather together at this one hub near the temple to celebrate Passover. The Passover celebration itself is like an occasion for people to get mad at Rome because Passover is all about the deliverance of the people of Israel out of bondage to the Egyptians. And, you know, if you're a Jew in the first century, you're like looking at those Romans thinking like, you guys really remind me of those Egyptians a little bit right now. This is like a dangerous time. So the Romans every year at Passover, they would increase the soldiers located in Jerusalem. This was just to try to protect against Jewish revolts. Uh, we actually read about one of these events that happened in 49 AD. This is what we read about in Josephus. He's an ancient Roman historian writing for the Romans. And Josephus puts it this way. He talks about 49 AD at Passover. He says, and I quote, but on the fourth day of the feast, listen to what happened. A certain soldier let down his breeches. Let's say he took down his pants or his skirt or whatever it was and exposed his privy members to the multitude, which put those that saw him into a furious rage. So he like flashed the people. Why? Cause, probably because he... He just, he wants to mock them and ridicule them. He doesn't like them. They're weird rituals in, in his mind. And so he flashes them. But the Jewish people saw this as an affront to not only themselves, but to their whole nation and to even God himself, right? So a riot ensues and thousands of people die because one soldier decided to moon the audience. That is the powder keg that Jerusalem was during Passover. And the leaders of, the Isra of, of Israel here, the, the high priest and the scribes, the Pharisees, the people who have power and authority, it's, it's kind of like an agreement between them and Rome that they're if they're going to keep their power, right? They do have some power, but it's limited. If they want to keep it, they have to keep the people from rebelling. So this is why Pilate would make concessions, even at the crucifixion of Jesus. He makes concessions to the people, to the leaders, the high priests, because they are kind of like helping control the people. This is a dangerous moment. Passover is a time where violence happens potentially and revolt can happen potentially as well. So this is why they say in verse two, 
right? That they say not during the festival. Otherwise, there might be a riot of the people. They, as the leaders who were in league with Rome, the Jewish leaders in league with Rome, they don't want the people to riot. They will lose their place. And they know, in fact, in 70 AD, that's what happens. Uh, Rome comes and just kills them all. So <clears throat> that is why they don't want to do it during the festival. So there's a problem. There's a dilemma in verses 1 and 2. This is the first part of the sandwich, right? The Mark and Sandwiches, for a reminder, anybody who doesn't know yet, right? Mark will tell a story that is split into two pieces. And in the middle, he'll put a different story. Maybe it happened chronologically there. Maybe it didn't. Sometimes it's one way. Sometimes it's another. This story happened probably a few days prior, right? As we talked about last week. But the first part of the story is, hey, we want to kill Jesus, but we can't do it during the Passover because it could start a riot. He has too many followers. There's zealous people who think he's going to overthrow Rome. If we partner with Rome to kill him in public, could start a riot. And so that's the problem. The solution is this woman anoints Jesus. This becomes the occasion where Judas decides to betray Christ. Then the bottom part of the sandwich, the rest of the story, Judas goes out to those leaders to betray him. That's the mark and sandwich that we have here. That is the um, the setup for the crucifixion of Jesus, which is soon coming in the gospel of Mark. Very soon coming. We're at the last moments. The last moments. Then we have in verse 3, moving along. Verse 3, while he was in Bethany at the home of Simon the leper and reclining at the table, there came a woman with an alabaster vial of very costly perfume of pure nard. And she broke the vial and poured it over his head. You guys already know a lot about this if you're with me for, for last week. So I'll just skim through the content. I don't want to repeat everything, but it's some kind of perfume. Is it oil? Is it not oil? The commentaries actually debate this. Some of them say it was not oil. Some say it was. I don't really know the right answer there. I don't think it's super relevant to what I'm going to share with you today. It was oilish, maybe? I don't know. We'll, uh, we'll just leave that floating. But it was extremely expensive. 300 denarii, that's worth like a year's salary. That, that's how much this was worth according to the Gospels, the various accounts of this thing. Um, it was made out of alabaster or, or stored in alabaster, which is just a soft stone that you could carve out and was typically used to store perfumes and expensive liquids. We also get other information about this woman who Mark just calls a woman. That's all we know about her. She's just a woman. We never find out her name. We don't get any more details. And in the Gospel of John, we find out it's Mary of Bethany. Now, in church tradition, and I want to stress the, the word tradition here, it's often thought that Mary was, this Mary of Bethany, that this is also Mary Magdalene. This might partly come because um, Gregory the Great, who was one of the early popes, um, Although the papacy developed over time slowly, so it's like it starts to get hard to whether you call someone a pope or not. But at any rate, you know, going back, you know, to 500 years after Jesus, you have Gregory the Great. He gives like a homily, a teaching where he confuses several women in the Bible. Uh, among them are Mary Magdalene and Mary of Bethany. He kind of makes them the same person. And that may have been one of the things that was helping contribute to uh, in church tradition. People thinking Mary of Bethany and Mary Magdalene whom Jesus cast demons out of, that it's the same lady. This is probably not the same lady. There's like six or seven Marys in the Bible. So just being named, named Mary is not really very interesting. Um, Mary was the most common name at the time for Jewish women in Palestine. There's Mary, the mother of Jesus, Mary, the wife of Clopas, Mary Magdalene, right? Who probably lived near Galilee, right? That's what her name's telling us about her. She probably lived, most likely, her, she lived near Galilee. And Mary of Bethany, who lived in Jerusalem or in Jerusalem the surrounding area of Jerusalem in the city of Bethany. So this is a um, a different Mary. That's the point. This is a different person altogether. Mark actually mentions Mary Magdalene specifically. He talks about her later on, but he doesn't mention the name of the woman in Mark 14 because it's probably a different woman. Uh, Luke seems to confirm this as well. So just a side issue. It's not really important theologically, but they're probably different women. I think people... People like to dig into the characters of the Bible, understandably. Like, I want to know more about Mary Magdalene. But also, then you couple that with Gnosticism in the second century that took these less known figures of the Bible and then tried to make them secret disciples with secret knowledge, including Mary Magdalene, right? That was one of the people they tried to prop up with secret information. Take the Da Vinci Code, which is like this modern fiction that pre pretends that it's real. It's Anyway, people are kind of over the Da Vinci Code now. But it's a bunch of hogwash in all reality. So this is why I don't want I don't want to feed into like mythologizing these people. Like Mary Magdalene, real woman. Mary of Bethany, real woman. Different, different ladies. Um, you might ask like, why doesn't Mark mention more about her? Why doesn't Mark tell us who the woman is? If it's Mary of Bethany, Mary the sister of Martha, sister of Lazarus, why doesn't 
Mark tell us? It may be that Mark Mark knows that his direct readers don't know these people personally. His readers are probably in Rome, the initial readers of Mark. And so he's writing about people that they may have access to. Uh, this is one theory. This is what Richard Bauckham puts forward in his book, Jesus and the Eyewitnesses, which I've referenced many times because I think it's like a paradigm shifting book for scholars and they it can help them stop uh, making messes with the Bible as frequently as they do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I could pull punches, but why? So um, yeah, he doesn't include the story of Lazarus either. So since Mark hasn't introduced Mary like John has, John has Lazarus and the resurrection of, of Lazarus, or excuse me, the um, being being brought back to life. I don't know, if, I wouldn't call it directly a resurrection. Anyway, different long story there with the meaning of the word. But Lazarus, him being brought back, that is in John. So when John gets to this passage, he talks about Mary specifically because he's already introduced that family. Mark is taking three years of Jesus's ministry and cramming it into a tiny little space. So he's not going to really waste time introducing characters he doesn't have a real motive to introduce by name. I think that's, that's the idea. Different focus, potentially different access to different witnesses. So whose home is it at? We talked about that last week. It's at Simon the Leper's house. Um, we went into that in detail. And then here's a question I didn't deal with last week, which has to do with supposed contradiction. I just forgot to talk about it. But in Mark, we read that she poured it on his head. But in John, in the Gospel of John 12, 3, we read that Mary took a pound of very costly perfume and she anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. Now, what's interesting is um, these are not, okay, this is what you call forcing a contradiction. These are not like ir irreconcilably different. Okay. So if, if Mary was to take, let's take Mark, this is, this is where you have a small amount of grace when you're reading other people's <laughs> reports and she pours out an entire 12 ounces of liquid. It's called a pound, but it's 12 ounces all over his head. It's going to run down all the way down his body. It's not going to stay on his head. Like it just magically floats around his hair. And What's interesting is that Mark says she poured it on his head. John says she anointed his feet. He doesn't say she poured it on his feet. He focuses on the meaning of what she's doing, not the action of where she poured it. So John never mentions where she poured it. Why? Because John, again, just like Mark, he's cramming data into small spaces. So he ignores how it got on his feet and just focuses on the fact that it ended on his feet. And he wants to talk about how she wiped it with her hair, probably being inspired by the woman in Luke 7. That's all I got to say about that. But I think that that's um, uh, showing that there's these forced contradictions that actually harmonize really well when you just take them at face value. Then we have verse four. Verse four in Mark 14, which tells us the response of the crowd. They were indignantly remarking to one another, why has this perfume been wasted? For this perfume might have been sold for over 300 denarii. And that, of course, is the value. That's a year's salary typical salary not like a rich person but like a typical laborer they get about a denarii a day and so that's a, a year of labor right they're not working every single day but that's approximately a year of salary which is just a crazy amount of money i, I don't know depending on where you live that a year typical year salary might be thirty thousand eighty thousand hundred thousand this is a significant amount of money and um the complaint is not i will point out again because I want us to notice this. It is not about the forwardness of a woman who pours this liquid on Jesus as he's just sitting there. He didn't ask her to. She just goes, but no one complains about her. And this silent oddness that nobody complains in that culture about the forwardness of the woman is answered by Luke 7 because Jesus already defended a woman who did this at a previous time. So of course, no one's going to complain about that again. And what does surprise me about their complaint, and this I want us to learn from. Okay, now I'm going to get myself in some trouble potentially some, some, some social justice trouble. Um, but I don't care. So in, I only ask this, as I talk about these issues, I, I hope that you'll hear me carefully. Um, what I'm about to say could easily be misunderstood. So please consider these things. Their complaint is couched in social justice terminology. The social justice terminology is the piety of taking care of the poor, right? This money could have been given to the poor. So She's doing something good that Jesus approves of, but they're going to re rebuff her, come against her because it could have been given to the poor. So we have a, a people group we're going to champion as our people who need help. And we're going to use them as a tool 
to rebuke people who were doing good things. This is what I see a lot right now in our culture. I pointed out not because of any issues I have between Republican Democrat, but because I think Christians are being pulled into these more and more polarizing divisive sides where here's one side Republican who's like everything you guys think and do is wrong. And the Democrats were like everything you think and do is wrong. And as a Christian, I cannot filter my value system through these two sides. I have to I have to start with Jesus and start with his character and I start with following him and then I'm going to find out when they ha when either side happens to be coincidentally consistent with my views as a Christian, great. But I I just I can't just pick a side and attack the other side all the time without first referencing my Christian worldview to ask if this is consistent. The reason why I point this out is because at least and I'm going to just be really honest with you guys, on the Democrat side, the social justice terminology is very similar to this. It's like we found a, a real people group who really needs help. We're going to target a certain group of people as like, these people need help. And we're going to use it to browbeat other people who are actually doing good things. Because we're going to like have a piety focused rebuke to those we don't appreciate, don't like, don't want. And I think that's happening in our culture too. I think there's a similarity there. And it seems like a direct application to what's going on today. Now, let me read on and we'll understand this more. And um, if you're upset, um, I'm sorry. I just hope you'll hear me. If you're not upset yet, I'll probably make you upset before the study's over. And again, I just hope you'll hear what I'm saying and just consider it. Maybe there's something I don't get. I fully acknowledge that. But I'm trying to, to follow Jesus in a culture that's trying to polarize us all more and more and more in ways that don't. Are, are neither side, in my opinion, is totally consistent with following Jesus. So I can't, in that sense, I can't pick a side. But I can pick sides on particular issues as a Christian first. And I think we all need to do that. But let's let's read on. In um, verse 6, we get Jesus' response. Let her alone. Why do you bother her? She's done a good deed to me. For you always have the poor with you. And whenever you wish, you can do good to them. But you do not always have me. Now, this is the phrase, you'll always have the poor with you, that I've heard used in various ways. And um, I'm going to talk about these things because, again, I think this is, now, is this the, the original teaching of the text? No, no, no. This is very much um, a very American interpretation perspective that I've heard put on Scripture that I want to talk about because I think that it, it, it pulls us away from our commitment to Scripture in Christ, mm -hmm. and it starts with a commitment to a political side and then uses the Bible to support that. So... Here's an odd view that I have heard, and you may have heard it too. Last night when I taught this in, in the in, in the local church where I where I teach on Sunday nights, um, I asked people if they'd heard this interpretation, and a lot of people raised their hand and were like, yeah, I've heard that too. I've heard it, and I've heard it many times. So it goes like this. The teaching of the Bible about the poor, about taking care of the poor, and this is in response to say like, should there be welfare programs with government? Should the government be doing like universal health care, things like that? Um, then the response is, but the Bible says that the church is supposed to take care of the poor, not the government. It's the church's job to take care of the poor. And when I first heard this, there was a part of me as a younger age where I thought, that sounds, that sounds pious. Like that sounds, and again, here's piety being used in a distorted fashion. It sounds pious. It sounds righteous. It sounds good. Like church's job, take care of the poor. I could definitely marshal a host of scriptures that support us taking care of the poor. But here are some problems with this view. First off, the church is almost always a minority. In most countries, it's a minority. This is like a pe peculiarly American teaching, most likely. right? And, and you might think I'm going to sound like a Democrat here. Like I don't care if you think that. My whole point is I want to be biblical. And if you feel like it crosses a line into looking Republican or looking Democrat, let that be coincidental. I just want to be biblical as a Christian. And I can't let these topics be off, off limits for me as a Christian because they, they've been claimed by political sides. But for those who want to use my Bible, right, my, my Jesus, right, they want to use this to say that the government should not take care of the poor because the church should, I don't see support for that in Scripture. Okay, don't say that that is biblical. That doesn't come from the Bible. That comes from you. The church is the minority in most countries, right? There was a time in, in the U.S. where it at least felt like the church was the majority. Whether it was or not, in reality, God knows, right? He knows the invisible, true believers in Christ. But then I could see people looking around, yeah, we'll take care of the poor. 
But I mean, can you imagine a country where there's like 3% Christians and then you go to these 3% probably oppressed, probably poor Christians and you tell them, you know, the 97% of non-believers out there in your country, maybe maybe 40% of them are poor. You 3% have to financially take care of the entire country. This is ridiculous. Like that's ridiculous. And it's not biblical. There's nothing in scripture that teaches this. So this is sometimes bounced off the statement, the poor are always with you. And then they go into various teachings on poor. In fact, in scripture in the Old Testament, if you want to take the Old Testament as an example um, of, of laws we should follow today with our current laws, and I don't think it's meant to be that way. I think that it's reckless when we randomly pull out Old Testament laws and try to apply them to modern governments because modern governments aren't a theocracy. They're not supposed to be. So if they try to pretend they are, they end up doing damage. Um, <clears throat> but in the Old Testament, the, the state actually enforced, the state, right? The, the law of Moses actually enforced taking care of the poor. So farmers, when they, for instance, when they would farm their crops, they would go through, they can only farm, they can only uh, reap one time, do one pass through. Now you would miss a lot of crops in your one pass through, but they were not allowed to go through again. They had to leave crops sitting there in the field they farmed and they worked for so that poor people could just come and grab what they, what they needed and eat it. They also couldn't glean the edges of their fields. They weren't to, to um, take any crops from the very edges of their fields, even though they planted it and they worked and all that. They just let the poor have it. Like that, that's really interesting. You know, when it came to like loaning to the poor, God tells the Israelites, if you loan to the poor, in fact, he tells them they should loan to the poor. They, they, they have to have an open hand to the poor. This is required of them. And then they cannot charge them interest when they loan to the poor. I mean, like in the U.S., this is like, this is something that's really harmful for people, right? When you're poor, and, and I remember growing up and yeah, my mom paying like a credit card with another credit card and eating so much Top Ramen that even today I can't stand this stuff. And Hamburger Helper, I'm like, I, I never want to eat that stuff again, you know? And and it's it's the it's the borrowing with high interest rates that that is oppressive to poor people. Like now I, you might think I sound like a Democrat here, guys. I'm not a Democrat. I think the Democrats are wrong on the most important social issues but that doesn't mean they're wrong on everything, right? Because I want to have my biblical worldview that is helping guide me in all these things. And when I look at the the loaning to the poor, but st you still required them to pay back, it wasn't just, yeah, anyway, but but there was no there was no interest allowed. And this is something God would actually judge them and punish them for if they charge interest to the poor. That's really interesting to me. Now, do I think we're supposed to take those laws and just put them in every government? No, I don't think that that's the rule of scripture. What I'm suggesting here is that when you look at the Old Testament, it's going to be a mixed bag if you're trying to be like, I'm Republican, I'm Democrat, and I'm just going to go look at the Bible and find support for whatever my views are. It doesn't really work that way. You should start with the Bible, come up with your views, and then see how they coincidentally line up with someone else in a particular area or not. Uh, for instance, the same, I've talked to a, a Democrat-leaning Christians who would say like, see, we need to we need to take care of the poor. We need to, like, th these are the biblical things. We have to require these as well. Somehow, in, in, you know, bring this in our society. And then I ask the same Democrat, do you want, do you want the Old Testament's laws on immigration? And they were like, well, what are those? And I go, oh, well, you know, like how, how immigrants, they can come to your country, but they can't permanently own land. Oh, well, I don't really like that. That doesn't fit my, my perspective on things. Well, see, because you don't really want the Old Testament enforced, the law of Moses enforced. I don't think we're supposed to. I, I think it was given to it. The reason why immigrants couldn't take land, for instance, in ancient Israel. And again, I know I'm starting a bunch of fires. But that's because I think there's things that are perhaps in some cases too dear to you that you haven't filtered through your Christian worldview. You've just become really entrenched in the political rhetoric of our culture. Now, when it comes to these things, Old Testament law, the reason why immigrants weren't supposed to own land in Israel isn't because God's against immigration. It's because the, law, the land of Israel was especially promised to Abraham and his descendants. This is a unique thing for Israel and for those people and for fulfilling God's promise. It's not like a rule that every nation should tell every other nation they can't own permanent land in their own nation. Like this is to take the scripture and use it, I think, wrongly. What I want to point out is how you just don't have this, you know, get in your trench, pick a side, and then try to use the Bible to support it. So the church does not have to take care of the poor um, uh, and tell the state they can't take care of the poor. I think the irony of this, of saying that the church takes care of the poor and the state doesn't, is that the church first can't take care of all the poor. We should take care of the poor, don't get me wrong. But not all of them, not the entire nation worth. They can't physically, we don't have the funds, we don't have the resources. 
But then what you're doing is you're a Christian in the name of Christ lobbying for government to refuse aid to the people that you think you're supposed to take care of and then you'll never take care of them. That doesn't seem like a good representation of Christ to me. This seems more like politics taking over my Christianity. So what does Jesus mean when he says you will always have the poor with you? And I do, I honestly, legitimately, I'm sorry if I'm frustrating anybody here. I'm trying to teach it to the best of my knowledge. If I'm wrong, tell me where I'm wrong, y'all. I'm all ears. I'm all ears. Um, but I'm trying to be a consistent Christian here. And when I look out at the different parties, I don't see anyone that allows me to be a consistent Christian. Um, I don't. And whether it's on one side or the other, and obviously, full disclosure, obviously the, the Democrat platform to me is the most contrary to the Christian faith when it comes into things like abortion, um, uh, marriage, what they call marriage equality, which is a, whole, a misnomer in and of itself. We're talking about the definition of what marriage is and the God's design for humanity, right? God's, God's still God. <laughs> Whether you have a theocracy or not, there's still a God in heaven who defines things. Um, or or the setup for persecution that's coming towards our culture, the whole idea of critical race theory stuff. That I have a video on that where we've tried to look at that from a Christian worldview. I think that that's very harmful to um, unity in the body of Christ and to and it increases the problems that it tries to deal with. It makes them worse. I think all that's true. I just also, as I'm trying to be an honest Christian, I also can't just sign the bottom line of the Republican Party and say, boom, I agree with whatever you guys say because it gets weird. It gets weird. So what did Jesus mean when he says the poor you always have with you? Here's what he meant. And it had nothing to do with politics, right? What he meant was they're always going to be around so you can take care of them anytime as you should, as you should. Christians are, we should definitely care for the poor. I, however, will not always be there, right? Jesus is about to be killed. He's going to be buried this anointings for his burial. And yeah, the money could go to the poor, but guess what? Jesus is more important than taking care of the poor. And that is actually, I think, and this is where um, social justice warriors are going to get upset with me, even though you might've been cheering me on a minute ago. Um, I think this is, this is where social justice stuff falls short. Jesus seems to think that dumping out a year's worth of salary, let's say in modern I don't know what the actual modern equivalent would be. Let's say it was $60,000 worth of, of, uh, of stuff and just dumping it on Jesus in honor of him for his burial, that that is more important than $60,000 to the poor. This is not what I frequently see in churches that tend to focus so much on social justice that the gospel takes a back seat or they even go a step further and they act like taking care of the poor just is the gospel. Like just taking care of the poor is the gospel. Like if you just go and help people and you serve people and you help them in their situation, that is the gospel. And your, your, your job is done. Your job is done. And I don't think that's the case. I think that Jesus's death is the center of the gospel and it's more important than our mandate, and it is a mandate, to take care of poor people and minister to those who are, are lacking and who are oppressed. I think that that's absolutely a mandate, but it's not as important as the gospel. This actually comes, Jesus's quote here comes from Deuteronomy Chapter 15, verse 11. He's quoting scripture here. He says, for the poor will never cease to be in the land. Now, some think, okay, so see, you can never stop it. You can never fix poverty. Well, it may be true that you'll never fix it. Doesn't mean you can't help, right? Here's the command though. Therefore, I command you, you shall freely open your hand to your brother, to your needy and poor in your land. He just commands the people individually, be generous, take care of the poor around you. And I think this is something uh, Christians need to be thinking about. Um, I love if you guys are giving to your church, your local fellowship, it'd be great if every Christian family that has the money would set aside their own personal benevolence fund that they could use to just help people when they need it, to just help them out, that you just, you just serve and help them. I mean, if all of the finances I have that I give are effectively going to just pay the salary of the people who work at church, then I think that I want to also have something I'm giving to just help the poor. That's something that's just something we're supposed to do. Okay. It's just... Nowhere near the importance of the gospel itself. That's why the oil gets poured out on Christ and it's more important than the poor. But helping the poor is still very important, right? In Mark 10, 21, Jesus tells the rich man to sell all he has and give it to the poor and just give it to the poor. When uh, Paul has a meeting with the apostles in Galatians, we read about it 
And in chapter two, verse 10, after they confirm that Paul, like, remember Paul had like vision, he saw Christ, he gets this message of the truth of the gospel, he's spreading it. And then he has this powwow where he's like, let me just make sure what I'm preaching is the same thing you guys are preaching. And they meet together and they discuss the details, their theology, right? And it's the same. Their theology is the same because it came from the same source. But then in chapter two, verse 10, the apostles ask Paul, they ask us to remember the poor, the very thing I was also eager to do, so that wherever the gospel went, they they would take care of poor people, they would emphasize the poor. This might mean uh, make sure you preach to the poor. Don't don't just go and preach to the to the highfalutin people, right? Preach to the poor. Preach to the poor. That could be part of it. It could also be um, remember in the local churches where you're planting churches, make sure that you guys are having money set aside that's for the poor of the community. I think that that was probably part of it as well. And we also have another passage frequently used to talk about uh, giving in church on Sundays, but it's actually, and it was on a Sunday, but it's actually about something a little different than what a lot of us think. It's 1 Corinthians 16, 2, where Paul instructs the Corinthians about giving. And he says, on the first day of every week, each one of you is to put aside and save as he may prosper so that no collections be made when I come. This interesting trivia here. This means that they were gathering on the first day of the week. That's Sunday. So they were they were gathering regularly on Sunday, not on the Sabbath, it seems, for this Gentile, mostly Gentile congregation. And they're to set aside money. They, so they pool their resources. We, we look at this as the giving time in the local church on Sunday mornings. I think it's appropriate. But Paul's reason for it is twofold. One, he doesn't want collections when he shows up. Paul does not want to walk in and have a love offering and then people give money and they give it to Paul because he's very sensitive to how that looks for the world. Like this is uh, one reason why, at least on my YouTube channel, I don't I don't allow super chats, right? I just can't imagine me right now teaching the word of God and then somebody who just loves the ministry and they're like, boom, $100 super chat, right? And the world watches on and they're like, ah, oh, that's what Mike's really all about. Now, it would, would make way more money if I had super chats. But the value of the gospel exceeds that value. Even if I just took all that money and just gave it away, the value of the gospel exceeds that. And the reputation of the gospel, even in the world, we have to, like Paul, guard against people thinking that we're all just money grubbers. Like they just they just come at it with this attitude. Plus there's so many real money grubbers out there that it's easy for, easy for non-believers to think that about us. So Paul's like, no collections when I come. This is why when he was in Corinth and he ministered, he wouldn't accept money. He built tents to take to pay for his own uh, expenses so that it would not hinder the gospel. And I think that he had a right to be paid for all the labor he puts in. He's laboring how many, many hours a week to serve the Lord, but he foregoed that right. Is that a word foregoed? Chose to forego that right in order to have a better bridge to preach the gospel. So he wants no collections, but here's the thing people miss. And it's in this passage coupled with uh, well, a longer reading of the passage, basically. The money was not to pay Paul. The money was not here to take care of and pay for the elders or the leaders of the church. It's appropriate that those who teach and labor, that they are worthy of their wages. Okay. If you want someone to work 50 hours a week, as a lot of pastors do, and then people don't want them to even get paid, this is cruelty, right? This is oppression of pastors in all reality. Um, it's one thing for them to give up voluntarily, but... For those who think that pastors deserve to get nothing, it's um, it's cruel and unusual. However, that's not what this giving was about. This giving was about taking a chunk of money from Corinth, where they were more affluent, and taking it to Jerusalem, where they were poor. Paul was giving an offering to poor saints who lived in a whole different city. And this inspires me to think like, yeah, should, should wealthy churches, churches that are in more affluent areas, should they just sponsor poor churches? Like, why not just find a church that, that need, and especially with our, our, the world is so connected now. It's easy. You know, the, the, the $5 here might, might be worth, might be a, stretch a lot further over there. And to have churches that just support poor uh, believers in other communities, I think is, is beautiful. Not just for their church, but even just that that grandma has food to take care of her, her grandkids or something. You know, th this is beautiful, beautiful stuff. So yeah, taking care of the poor is important. It's implied in Jesus' words. You always have the poor with you. He's not saying, as I've heard some people say, um, since you always have the poor with you, there's nothing you can do about it. That's not what he's saying. He means you always have them with you so you can help them some other time. Today, this moment is about me. It's about the gospel. It's about my burial, which is the center of the gospel message. Here's a principle we can learn from this and apply it to our um, 
social justice, our rightful social justice concerns, because we should care about the poor. We should care about the oppressed. We should care about racism in our culture. We should care about all that kind of stuff. And we need to do it from a Christian worldview and not from critical race theory, which is a, an unchristian worldview, ultimately. Um, we, we need to do it from our perspective as believers in Christ, in reality and not in the fantasy land that people are being polarized into nowadays. As I make everybody angry, uh, maybe, or maybe somebody goes, maybe he has a point. But here's the principle. Take care of the poor, but loving God is more important. The generosity of pouring this oil on Jesus, it was better than even giving it to the poor at the time. Loving God is more important than loving man. This is something that social justice always, always forgets. Social justice warriors make man God. Not every time, but it happens a lot. It happens a lot. Man is the end all be all. Man is the start and the finish. I think that we need to have our priorities right and know that God is more important than man. Loving God is more important than loving man. And often our loving of man needs to be an extension of simply our love for God, right? We love God so much that we love others as well, even when they're unlovable. I would say loving God is more important than loving man is one principle in scripture. But another principle, right? And this comes from Jesus. He's like the first and greatest command. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and then love your neighbor as yourself, right? These are different qualities of love. You can love people in a sense too much, um, Really, it's the vacancy of love for God in your heart that makes it look like it's too much. But yeah. The second principle is that the gospel is more important than financially helping the poor. Now, this is some um, some mistakes we sometimes make is like, uh, it, it's, how do I put it this way? The gospel is offensive, but helping the poor is not really very offensive. <laughs> okay, so it's easy for us as Christians to do good for people and to just never mention the gospel because it's going to burn bridges. Yet doing nice things for people tends to build bridges. But my thought is that if you're not bringing Jesus across that bridge, then it's a bridge to nowhere. Like there's no purpose. Ultimately, I'm, I'm giving you food for today, but you will die tomorrow. And then you will stand in judgment tomorrow. So labor for the food which does not perish like jesus says like this is this is clear the gospel and getting people saved is more important than financially helping the poor absolutely it absolutely is that jesus says like what is a prophet of man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul so this is just a reminder this is our christian filter we look at the world around us and we have to say hey you love philanthropy world you don't love the gospel but guess what my priorities are not the same I love philanthropy, but I love the gospel even more. I'm going to do both, but my priority is the gospel of Christ. If the gospel is not welcome there, then maybe I'm not welcome there. And that's just how it is. But on the flip side, right, it's not the job of the church to take care of every poor person to the overwhelming of the gospel. So take care of the poor, but don't make it the whole job of the church. Um, and again, I think it's weird to oppose government aid to the poor because you think it's the church's job. This is not, this is a political talking point. This isn't a Christian talking point at that point. Um, maybe you can have a debate on whether the Democrats plan to take care of the poor is successful or not, uh, but don't try to use Christianity to say that government shouldn't take care of the poor. That's not a Christian value. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. Um, yeah. And we can apply that to any social justice issue. The gospel first, the gospel is better. The gospel is more important. The gospel is essential. And the other issues are secondary. Then we have verse 8. If you're still with me, if I haven't lost you all, unsubscribe. <laughs> um, Mark 14, 8. She has done what she could. She's anointed my body beforehand for the burial. And I like this because, um, uh, you know, when we lose a loved one, the first thing we think is like, what else could I have done? And he just acknowledges she did what she could. And that's a calmness that brings comes into our hearts when you're like, you know what? Did I do what I could? I think I did what I could. I think I did what I could. And then that brings like a peace to us because just as Jesus says here, she did what she could. Like she's not going to stop uh, his, his crucifixion. But she does what she could. She anoints his body beforehand for burial. And you as a Christian, you're not called to change the world. You're called to do what you can. And then God does what he wants with what you do. Right? You just do what you can. And... Be content in that and press on and don't be discouraged. Uh, absolutely. So now the next question is this, theologically, like what is going on? Like why is he being anointed beforehand for burial? This is obviously an odd thing. It's a strange idea. Being anointed beforehand for burial. Let me throw out some possibilities. And this is where I think 
it gets beautiful. I think this is where the passage shines. I think I get excited about this stuff. What's going on here? Here are some possibilities, and there may maybe more than one of them is true. At least I think they are. One is that Jesus wouldn't be anointed prior to his death properly. Uh, now you might say, but in in uh, in uh, in scripture, in John in particular, we have Jesus being anointed. Right? They they buy. Um, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, they take Jesus off the cross. They put him in Joseph's tomb. And it says they, they get 75 pounds of spices and wrap his body. So obviously there was some anointing type thing going on there. But it seems obvious that this was not enough. Because the same women who witnessed this came back on Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. And they, according to Mark 16, 1, they brought spices so that they might come and anoint him. So maybe there was an anointing of some kind, but there was some sense in which it seemed deficient. Maybe they didn't have the right spices, the right amount. Maybe it just wasn't the right ceremonial process. And so there was some sense in which Jesus is, he wasn't treated with the honor that he deserves in the eyes, at least of the people. Yet there was this moment they could think back to where, she, where he was anointed for burial. And here's the lesson, if, if, if this theory is right. Jesus was given honor before his shame. Right? The, the cross is the most shameful, shameful thing you could experience back then. The cross was so offensive and shameful that they didn't even like to use the term in ancient writing. So they would say things like in ancient texts we found that talk about crucifixion. They would say not crucifixion. They would talk about the extreme penalty. They would use like a euphemism because it was so jarring. Now, if you had lived back then and you had actually walked down the road and seen a crucifixion victim and you knew that this 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 penalty was so shameful, it was illegal to do it to a Roman citizen. Like you couldn't even crucify him if they're a Roman citizen because it's such a shame to the person. The Even in the Jewish mentality, it's like it's one who hangs on a cross, one who hangs on wood. If they're hanging on wood in some fashion, being fixed to a cross, you're hanging, you're being fixed there, that they are cursed, right? Which is all a picture of Jesus being cursed the curse, becoming the curse for us so that we might be uh, healed and forgiven. All that to say, Jesus here at the book ends, talk about, here's a Markin sandwich for you, at the book ends, right? In the middle of the sandwich, you have Jesus being crucified, the most shameful thing to happen in that culture to represent my shame and your shame. He takes our death, our penalty, all the guilt of all the sin you've ever, the worst moment where you felt the most guilty in your life, he takes that from everybody all at once. But on the bookends or the sandwich, the bread of this this situation is that Jesus is anointed for burial, given incredible honor, this year's worth of salary poured upon his head because he is, he is God's chosen one, because he's holy, because he's good. And then after the death, he's buried where? In a tomb of a rich man. So he's given honor before and after the shame that he experiences. So I think this is a beautiful picture of Jesus. He has his honor and he has our shame and he takes them to the cross. And I think it's a beautiful thing. Another thing that might be happening here with why she's anointing him before his burial is because Jesus is our great high priest. The book of Hebrews really emphasizes the high priest nature of Christ. And one psalm in particular connects to this. Remember that the high priest, um, it was designed by God, the idea of a high priest, to be a picture of Jesus. The high priest is the guy that goes before. He goes before God to represent the people. He even, quote, bears the sin of the people. Jesus quite literally did that for us. Well, in Psalm 133, verse 2, we read this about Aaron, who is the first high priest. He's the iconic high priest in the scripture, represents Jesus. And it says that um, fellowship, Christians fellowshipping or believers fellowshipping, it is like the precious oil upon the head, coming down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, coming down upon the edge of his robes. This is a description of how fellowship is like oil being poured out on, on Aaron's head. This is Aaron being anointed to be the high priest. Notice that when Aaron in this psalm is anointed, he's not just given a dab on like his thumb or his earlobe or something like that, which we read about in, in um, uh, Leviticus. He's actually, and I think Exodus as well, he's actually getting a, a whole thing poured over him, which is what Jesus has happening in the gospel of Mark and in, well, in multiple gospels. I think that this is to be a picture of how Jesus is our high priest. He's the one who goes before and it can, he can actually go into the presence of God, bearing the sin of the people and not die or ultimately conquer death, right? Overcome death because he is the Holy One. So it's beautiful. It's a, it, it's a beautiful picture of Christ. If you're interested in this, there's a video I have. If you just type, you know, my name and then the word high priest or high priest garments or something like that, it'll pop right up. But it's about the symbolism of the high priest and it's amazing stuff. I think that's connected here too. Let me give you a third thing 
that this anointing on Jesus may represent. And that is Jesus as king, as Messiah, who was a kingly figure, or as the son of David, who is the, the king, the, the descendant of David, who's to be the king. Now, in 1 Samuel 16, when David is anointed, he, he's, okay, Aaron's the iconic high priest, represents Jesus in his high priestly role. David is the iconic king of the Old Testament, representing Jesus in his kingly role. And what's interesting about the anointing of David is that it happened in private, in secret, without the awareness of the ruling leaders of the time. And so in the same sense, Jesus is here anointed in secret, anointed in private, without the awareness of Caiaphas and those who are plotting his death. In fact, it's not long after David's anointed that Saul tries to kill him, the king of the time, right? Because it's this, it's a similar picture of the life of Christ that we see here. So I think that's also pretty cool. The um, Messiah means anointed one. I mean, that's what the etymology of the word means. The word carries much more depth and meaning than that, but that's the etymology of it. And I'll give you one more thing that I think is awesome. And I have to fully admit, um, I didn't find this in a commentary. Um, I'm sure there's some commentaries that say it. I just don't read every commentary on the planet. But I think it's I think it's probably true. God is so into. Let me. How do I put this? The Bible is actually true, like what it says historically happened. Historically happened. All that's the case. But God is so orchestrating the lives of human beings that He draws pictures with our lives. He draws beautiful illustrations of the truths of Christ throughout the lives of the people in the Bible. So David, his whole life is like a picture of Christ, right? The, the high priest is a picture of Christ. We get the bronze serpent, right? That, that was a picture of Christ being lifted up for us. We, we just get story after story, Adam and Eve in the garden. There's a picture of Jesus in the church. We get so many things one after another. And I think that the, the breaking of this vessel, the pouring out on Jesus, that the anointing of Jesus is a picture of the entire offering of the gospel of Christ. I think that she broke it, right? Now, this is considered odd. Commentaries debate this. They're like, why did she break the vial? Mark says she broke it. Why didn't she just open it? And they debate it. And we don't know the right answer here. Some commentaries think you had to break it because this alabaster thing, that was the only way to get the oil out was to break it. Um, it's possible, but one commentary complains, well, you know, they got it in there somehow, right? It's not like it was solid alabaster. There had to be some sort of seal. Why couldn't you just cut around and pop the seal out? Um, so that's a good question. Maybe breaking it was a sign of like, I'm not, I'm going to use it all. So I'm going to break it because I'm going to pour it all out. And then the, then the container is not important anymore. Maybe that was it. Maybe Mary was rushed and she didn't have someone to help her open it. And she didn't have a tool with her. So she just cracks it and pours it on him in a hurry because she doesn't want anyone to stop her from what she's about to do. These are all possibilities, but there's a picture possibility as well. That the vessel is like Jesus's body broken for you. And that the oil or the liquid, the fragrance, this super expensive, probably an heirloom of the family, this, this, this vial, this super expensive liquid is completely and utterly poured out, which to the, to the world looks like it was wasted. This is like Jesus, his body broken for you. This is like Jesus, his blood of greater value than anything you've ever seen poured out. And as they're looking at the cross, they think the same thing as what they thought when they saw this woman wasting this liquid poured out on Jesus. They see Jesus's blood and they're thinking, what a waste. And it's the same as, as in this anointing, Jesus could look and be like, they just don't know yet. They just don't know yet. The value of this thing. This thing's more important than taking care of the poor. Why? Because this thing is taking care of the spiritual poverty of mankind. It brings you forgiveness of sins. It restores you in your relationship to God. It brings you eternal life. Of course, it's more important than taking care of the poor. I think we have the value of Christ in this oil. We have the breaking of Christ in the alabaster and we have the pouring out of Jesus, his body broken, his blood poured out. Beautiful, beautiful picture. Gets me excited <laughs> to see it right there before the crucifixion. They don't understand it yet. But when they get it, they will tell the story of this woman throughout the world because it is just the gospel itself. So there we are at the very end there in Mark um, 14 verse 9 at the end of Jesus' statement, truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman's done will also be spoken of in memory of her. I think that uh, this is prophetic in multiple ways. Uh, for one thing, Jesus, he's saying two things, that the gospel is going to get preached in the whole world and that this story of this woman will be told. Like those are prophetic things. They're kind of a big deal when you realize that Jesus is just this like guy in the Middle East who has a, sure, it's a significant following-ish, right? But not not really that big. 
um, certainly can't overthrow the Romans or even the Jewish powers. He could just cause a lot of problems at the moment, at least humanly speaking. This is a pretty big deal. Now, some commentaries actually deny, I, I say this because I want you guys to know, as you're reading different commentaries, that there are, it, it's a, there's a bunch of landmines out there, okay? And there's guys who make their living writing these commentaries, and they may or may not be solid Christians, okay? And in some ways they're solid, in some ways they're not, and in some ways they're not even Christians in some cases. But some of them will deny that Jesus even said this. They'll say, verse 9, Jesus didn't say that. Why? Because it would involve supernatural knowledge of the future. See, this is what happens when you approach the Bible with an anti-supernatural mentality, right? Um, obviously, a Christian should have no problem um, granting that Jesus said this. But I want you to keep in mind something else. There's another way in which it's prophetic, and I'll take us, it connects us to another prophecy. Psalm 22, verse 27. Now, I love Psalm 22. Um, I have a whole video teaching on this in detail about how Psalm 22 is a detailed, like more than people realize, detailed prophecy of the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ. But what people don't realize, they kind of quit reading the psalm after they get to like by his stripes, you know, or, or uh, not by his stripes, that's Isaiah. After they get to they pierced his hands and feet. After they get to that verse, they kind of like stop reading the psalm. But actually one of the most profound prophecies is in verse 27 of Psalm 22. It says, all the end of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of the nations will worship before you. And this should blow your mind that this ancient text written a thousand years before Christ was even walking the earth describes his crucifixion hundreds of years before crucifixion was invented. It gives the details. But it also describes the impact that this event will have on the entire planet. I mean, it's a prediction about nations all over the earth and they're all going to turn and worship the God of Israel, right? They'll turn to, and this see the capital L-O-R-D? They'll turn to Yahweh. Nations around the world were turned to Yahweh. This is one of the biggest predictions in the Bible. That this thing that looks just like the crucifixion of Jesus will cause the earth to have people from all over the planet turning and worshiping Yahweh. Now, was that happening at the time of Jesus? Absolutely not. Was it expected at the time when the psalm was written? Not really, except prophetically. It wasn't a reasonable expectation. I think this is, um, yeah, it's kind of a big deal. Then we also get the fact that the reason why um, what whatever wherever the gospel goes, what this woman's done will be will be preached as well, is because what she's done is connected to the death of Christ, and the death of Christ is the center of the gospel. That's something we take for granted. But even this week, I saw a very prominent guy on Twitter, a very well known guy, much more well known than I am, and he was saying that, and it goes like this: this is this is a social justice warrior moment for for. Um, diminishing the gospel of Christ in the name of social justice, uh, which is sad. The, um, the statement goes like this. Did Jesus preach the gospel? And you go, well, of course he did. And then they want to limit the meaning of the gospel to whatever Jesus preached early in his ministry. This is something I've heard from different people, um, different progressives, different, you might call them progressive Christians, right? They say, well, Jesus, is, he preached the gospel, right? Well, he preached it before he died and rose, which means that his death and resurrection aren't really part of the gospel or they're not an important part. This is wrong. Every Christian inherently knows this is wrong. If you read the Bible, if you don't chop the Bible into pieces and take things out of context, it's pretty easy to see this. But what I want to point out is in Mark, we have support for this because Jesus clearly thinks, though he preached the gospel early in his ministry, the gospel is not fully understood yet. Because he thinks that wherever the gospel goes, what this woman's done is also going to be spoken of. In other words, he was preaching the gospel truth that he had come and was preaching repent and believe, but the details of how this would be accomplished were not yet revealed. It's after the death and resurrection that, like Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, that this is the center of the gospel, that Christ died for our sins, right? that he, that he was buried and that he rose in three days, that this is... Um, the center of the gospel. So for those who on a progressive side want to limit the gospel to like what Jesus was teaching in John 1, um, this is this is just social justice warrior hijacking of scripture. Um, and, and Christians, we can be social justice warriors in the true Christian sense, but not in the progressive Democrat sense. It just doesn't work. It just doesn't work. I don't think it's consistent with our faith. All right. If I haven't burned every bridge that exists in 
our world. Let me go to verse 10 and finish this Bible study. Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the 12, went off to the chief priests in order to betray him to them. They were glad when they heard this and promised to give him money. And he began seeking how to betray him at an opportune time. And this is, of course, the close of the sandwich, right? The dilemma earlier of the Jewish leaders. Hey, we want to kill Jesus. We don't want to start a riot during Passover. Um, the problem is they, they can't take him publicly because it may start a riot or revolt. They can't take him privately because they can't find the guy. They can't find the guy. And there aren't exactly streetlights and flashlights to go searching around at night for Jesus. They can't wait until Passover is done because Jesus leaves Jerusalem. And then he's out of their sort of power circle. And they can't get him in Galilee. They don't have nearly the power in Galilee that they have here in Jerusalem. So the solution is Judas is like, hey, I will lead you to him when he's away from the crowds in the middle of the night. And that's exactly what happens. So this is... This is um, this is, this is the solution. This sets the stage. This creates the tension. The, the dark music, so to speak, in the storytelling is building here at this point. Um, this would be the cliffhanger at the end of the episode, right? Where he's like, I'll bet what, do you, what will you give me? I'll betray him. And it solves their problem. Here's a question, though. Why doesn't Mark mention that Judas was the one who was leading these complaints? I mean, he was leading it. John mentions it, but Mark doesn't. Some would suggest that this is actually a contradiction, but I think the opposite is true. It's a confirmation. So the way Mark couches the story with his sandwich, you know, they have they have a problem, this event happens, Judas then decides to betray Jesus. It's clear there's a connection between these things. That's clear. That's the Mark and sandwich. But what the connection is, isn't abundantly clear. It's like implied, but it's not totally clear. What John does when he says that Judas in particular wanted to um, take the money and not, he wanted to sell the, this perfume and get the money because he was stealing from the treasury. When John says that, we realize that this is an, I would call it an undesigned coincidence. This is where questions that Mark brings up are answered indirectly by John. I think that that's interesting. And um, <clears throat> and it's it's a mark of historicity, I think is what it, what's going on there. Now, why doesn't Mark then say that Judas was leading this thing. And I think the point is that God wants, at least in some of the gospels, for us to stop and ask the question, maybe I'm like them too. Because it's easy to say, oh, it's Judas. It's the bad guy, Judas. He's got dark circles under his eyes. You know, he's in some paintings I've heard, he has like horns, right? And um, and this is, uh, this is the bad guy, Judas. Like that would never apply to me because I'm not like Judas. But maybe by just saying it was something that the disciples were generally complaining about. This could have been given to the poor. It helps us realize that we could fall into these same problems. So let me look for a minute at some of the mistakes that Judas went through. And let's look at it from the guys, the question of, um, I could go through that too. Because I don't think Judas was initially as bad as you might think. I think he became progressively worse. And I know that that is the nature of sin. Ephesians says that sin, it grows corrupt. Like the sinful flesh, it grows, grows corrupt. That's the term in Ephesians. That's interesting that this old man, it grows, the old nature grows more corrupt. The more I sin, the worse I become. So it's not just about people, you're, you are bad, you are good. It's more, what path are you on right now? Are you on that path towards godliness or the path towards sin? Are you putting on the flesh or putting on the new man to be renewed in um, righteousness and holiness? So here's what we know about Judas. And we can apply this to our lives. Number one, Judas was chosen by Jesus. This is clear in scripture. Quick, I'm going to run through five things we know about him. Judas was chosen by Jesus. Um, this speaks of God's sovereignty and his plan. Yes, he chooses people he knows will turn their back on him and betray him. And he uses them because, well, he uses humans, flawed, fallen humans. And he works all things together for good. I take comfort in this. Because when I know about, say, like the Ravi Zacharias situation, I know God is still sovereign. I don't understand all the details as to how, but I trust his goodness. And that's encouraging to my heart. Number two, Judas, and this part blows my mind. We often don't think about it. Judas cast out demons and healed people in the name of Jesus. This is something all the 12 did. He sent them out two by two and they cast out demons and they came back and they're like, they were subject to us in your name. We healed people in your name. Like this, these are things that they, he really did. Like he did miracles in the name of Christ, like legit right in front of your face, miracles in the name of Jesus. This implies that your wonderful supernatural acts do not secure your godliness, that godliness and character issues are actually more at the root of our problems 
and our seeking for prophecy or miracles or God answering our prayers, these are beautiful and great things, but they don't answer the issue of my character. How is my character? Am I walking with Christ? Am I abiding in Jesus right now? The third thing we learn about Judas is that he was in charge of the money. Now, uh, we, we know this, right? But the, my point here is that it implies trust. You generally put someone you trust in charge of the money. And we don't know all the reasons why. We don't even know what Judas did for a living. At least I can't think of anything he did for a living in particular. Um, so for some reason, he's in charge of the money. So he was highly trusted, it appears. He, he's, you wouldn't have looked around at all the disciples and been like, that's the guy. <laughs> he's going be, to betray Jesus. We also know this, and this is also really important. He was stealing from the treasury. So he's in charge of the money. He's also stealing from it. Um, was he already a thief before? Did he become a thief over time? Did he get disenfranchised? These are all things we could just guess about. But we do know he seemed to be living a secret life. Because if you're traveling with Jesus and you're, and you're living with these guys day and night and you're stealing the money, this means that if you buy something with that money you've stolen, you have to sneak away to buy it. You have to hide what you've bought. Lest they look down and be like, wow, check out your Jordans, your Air Jordans. Now, those are nice, nice sandals you got there, Judas. Like they're going to notice if he's suddenly, you know, one of those preachers in sneakers, you know, <laughs> and they're going to be like, what's up? Where'd that money come from, man? Like we all have the same stuff, right? So he had, now, did he have like a separate money bag where he was slowly siphoning off the treasury? Did he have to like individually wrap the coins with cloth so they wouldn't jingle when he walked? Like Judas was living a secret life. This is a warning to you and me. It's one thing to struggle with sin. You do. I do. Every day. Living a secret life is different because there's a whole structure. There, there's, there's all the cover-up behavior that goes on. That's dangerous to us. This is, this is like where the red flag should be shooting up. If you're living a secret life, um, act now for the sake of your very life. Act now to change that now to come clean, to get rid of all this, all the secret things and to just get your life right because this will not stop where it's at. It's going to progress and get worse over time. And then number five, we know what triggered Ju Judas's betrayal of Jesus and it, it also implies his double life, right? It was this moment where he, he couldn't get the money. Uh, he was a massive amount of money. He was going to take even 10% of it was a huge amount of money for him, however much he was going to steal. This is something he wasn't going to get his hands on and he gets very upset and he gets bitter. He gets bitter. He's bitter. Guard your heart because sin in your life can turn to bitterness towards the church and towards Christ. This is, this doesn't mean if you're, if you're, you've been hurt or wounded, um, that, that those hurts or wounds weren't real, but there's, let me just counsel you like pastorally for a second and suggest there's a chance that your bitterness towards the church is partly rooted in your guilt over your own sin issues because we sometimes don't handle our guilt well and we project our guilt as bitterness towards others. And I think that this is something that Judas is doing, potentially at least. He's bitter. He's bitter. His, his love turns to hatred. First, he has two loves. He loves the demons getting cast out in Jesus' name. He loves the heal healings. He likes Maybe he likes the attention. I don't know. Maybe he really likes it. Maybe there's parts of him that really is endeared. Like he loves Jesus in some sense, but he has his love for the flesh, his love for his secret life, his love for his other plans, his love for money, his love for pleasure. Eventually, these loves conflict and he picks money and he is bitter towards Christ and he turns and betrays Christ. And then finally, Satan enters his heart. Satan uh, puts it into him to betray Christ, but this wasn't without his own compromises. So my conclusion is, right, he, he had a double life, compromised loves, his love turned to hate, his hate turned to betrayal, his betrayal turned then finally the sad part. I mean, the whole thing's sad, but his finally his, his betrayal of Christ turns into self-condemnation and self-destruction, right? It wasn't long after he betrayed Christ that he brought the money back and said, I can't take this, this is blood money. And then he went out and he hanged himself. And I, I at least hope that Judas, even at that point, could have turned. And he may not have been a shining leader in the church, but perhaps could have turned and at least been saved, uh, at least been forgiven. But he seals his own fate. And so often, this is the case, the things we think will bring us freedom, our little secret sins, they bring us into bitterness. Our bitterness turns into us betraying the church, betraying Christ. I mean, there are those who's who are making their, their whole 
TikTok platform, their whole like YouTube thing is about their bitterness towards the church. And they just, they just ooze out bitterness in every video. And it's sad. It's sad. And then eventually this turns into like a self-condemnation, self-destruction. And at any point, I would say at any point, if you could just interrupt the Judas and be like, hey man, how about now you change? How about today you make a difference? Even after he betrayed Christ, I would still hold out hope for him to come. And if you've if you're still listening to this message and you're like totally backslidden, you're bitter towards the church, your life, you've been living this double life and you found yourself loving the double life and starting to hate the Christian life. Like it's getting that distorted in your head. I'm telling you, even if you've been betraying, you've been bad mouthing believers and bad mouthing Christ, even scripture, I'm telling you, like we're inviting you back right now. Like, yes, we are. Um, because we're like you, sinners who need grace. And we, we see in you ourselves. And we want to bring you back into the fold of those who are simply forgiven and who just give up their fighting and trust in Christ. And I would say turn now is the lesson of Judas. Just turn now. Whatever, wherever you're at, turn now. If you're hearing me, it's not too late. Turn now. So our admonitions then today are avoid the slow slide that Judas went through and just turn now. And two is be like Mary. Be like Mary. This woman, she had a heart overflowing with gratitude towards Jesus, perhaps because Lazarus, her brother, had been raised, that she's like so grateful to Christ for what he's done. And she just pours this whole oil. Like she's all she has, the best she has, just just poured out to God, just given to God. And however that looks in your life in different ways, just give God all you got. Worship him with the best you have and be like Mary. God, the best I've got belongs to you for your glory. Um, helping others Yes, I want to help others in your name, but worshiping and loving and glorifying you, that is that is the center of it all because I, I love you with with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength. And that's that's the desire. That's the direction we head in. So I hope that this is, has blessed you guys. I hope I haven't burned any bridges. And I want to just, again, before we close in prayer, I want to mention this. If I am erring on how I'm applying scripture into our modern, super polarized political climate, I'm sorry. Like, it's not intentional. Um, at least know this, what I'm trying to model, my attempt is to model faithfulness to scripture, faithfulness to Jesus, letting that be just sunk into stone in my heart, and then trying to apply it to this polarizing culture, realizing that I can't exactly pick a pole and just go that way. I have to navigate through the issues as a Christian one step at a time. That much I'm pretty confident of, and I hope I'm navigating those issues well. And I'm interested even in pushback and people who would, who would want to say, oh, I think you should rethink this part of it. I'm totally open to that. Uh, may God give us wisdom. But may the world look at us and see that our allegiance is to Christ. That's the thing. I'm a Christian. My allegiance is to Christ. And I don't feel like I can identify as much else nowadays. Let's pray. Lord, we ask for your clarity in our own lives as we evaluate ourselves, as we hear a message like this, and it's natural to be thinking about our own life, our own walk, the things we do and when no one's around, the stuff that we've got going on that is consistent with our Christian faith or inconsistent with it. We pray for wisdom to navigate political climates where everyone's trying to, they're sort of grabbing Jesus to shape them into their image right now. We, we want to be shaped into the image of Christ. We pray for that instead, that Jesus, you're the one who sets the standard and we just follow it. And God, we... Um, we pray that you'd be you'd be blessed with our lives. You'd be glorified in us, and that the gospel, the gospel, will be on our lips to a dying world, to tell them the truth and the love and the forgiveness there is in Christ. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Thank you all for joining, and I will um, be with you soon. Um, this week, I'm going to do a video responding. I've mentioned this before to Brandon Robertson's. Jesus is race. Jesus was a racist video. Me and him actually had a little back and forth on Twitter. Um, he was bothered that I wasn't bringing him on for a discussion. Instead, I was going to break down. Um, I got into that in detail on Twitter. The, the, I honestly, you could, you could go read the Twitter thread if you want. I, I think it was an unhealthy desire to try to control the conversation. Um, I'm going to do a real breakdown. It's going to be in detail. I'm going to look at what he said, what he taught, the truth of the matter. I'm going to look at the guy who inspired his teachings, Miguel De La Torre, who's a scholar although he doesn't seem to handle information the way scholars normally should, uh, gives misinformation, we'll handle the misinformation, all that stuff. And that's coming up this week. So that'll be probably in a day or two. I'll get that up. All right. Because Jesus was not a racist. <laughs>